Happy New Year, New Year everyone. I'm Gary Rebholtz. Welcome to another live Sony Creative Software webinar. Uh, today we're going to talk about compositing and masking, two, um, two techniques in Vegas Pro that are a lot more powerful than people a lot of times uh, realize and maybe quite underutilized in a lot of um, uh, people's work. Uh, some of the stuff we're going to talk about is gets a little um, mathematical, a little, little um, uh, deep, but I'll try to walk you through it and show you how these uh, tools work and then hopefully show you some of the things that you can do with these tools. Um, so at the end of the pr uh, presentation, we'll, we'll go for about 45 minutes as we usually do and then we'll set aside some time for questions at the end. So go ahead and send your questions via the chat window. Uh, remember that you won't see the chats that you send. We only, uh, we only um, publish a few of them just because we get so many of them, we can't really keep up with them, but we'll go through the chats that we get and, and pick some of the questions that we'll ask uh, and try to answer at the end of the, at the, end of the, the uh, presentation. So let me switch over to the computer here and talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing here. So as I said, we're going we're to be looking at um, uh, masking and compositing. Uh, we've talked about most of these tools in previous webinars, but I kind of wanted to get into a little bit more detail uh, on a couple of these things so that you can uh, get a better handle on, on uh, how to use them. So we'll be, we'll be looking at uh, masking features both with uh, the filters and compositing modes. We'll, we'll work with various compositing modes. Uh, and I'll try to explain how compositing works in Vegas Pro. And then I'd like to try to spend some time on the Bezier masking tools that we've talked about in previous webinars uh, and, and talk about how they really work and try to give you a, a good education on, on how the tool works and how you can start using it in your projects. We're going to create a couple of different effects uh, in the, the course of the presentation. We're going to take some text and fill, it, fill that text and other objects uh, with video. We're going to do some cloning experiments with uh, uh, some, some human cloning uh, video that, that we've got, uh, some special effects, and, and working with problem footage and using some of these tools to try to um, solve some of the problems that you, have in the, that you might have in some of your, uh, your footage. So let's switch over to Vegas Pro and get started. So I've got a, a, a real simple project here that I want to use just to kind of introduce the, the concept of, of uh, <coughs> compositing. Now I know a lot of you know what compositing is, but, but we also have uh, users that don't really know what that means. What does compositing mean? Well, if you look at my project right now, you can see in my video preview window, in fact, let me zoom in here a little bit if I can. and. Um, you'll be able to see that in my video preview window, I have uh, a picture of a guy sitting on the rocks here. And in the timeline, you see that I've got two, two um, events. Now, in, in the default mode, when you put one event underneath another event in Vegas Pro, um, you, you, the default mode, which is called source alpha compositing, basically is looking for any transparency in that top track. If it doesn't see any transparency in the top track, well then you don't see through to the bottom track. And that's why in this picture where we've got um, the, the, the man sitting on the rocks, you don't see through to the, the picture of the lake, the, the long view of the lake uh, in the track below it. Now there are several different compositing tools that we can use so that you can see through. And you've got event level compositing tools, you've got track level co compositing tools, we're going to talk about automation, uh, and, and then we're going to move into filters and effects and so forth. So let's just start real simply with the tools on the event itself. So if I zoom into this event a little bit, just so you can see it, if I point to the top of the event, you see that my cursor changes, uh, and I don't know if the, uh, the tooltip comes over the, the internet stream here, but I've got a tooltip that pops up that says opacity is 100%. So it's 100% opaque, meaning I can't see through to what's below it. But when I point to the top edge like that, that's actually an, uh, an event level envelope that I can pull down. And as I pull it down, that opacity reading on my tooltip is dropping. I'm at 72%, 70, 65. And the farther I go down, the more you see what's underneath. 
And in fact, if I go far enough and put the opacity of the top track to zero, then you see just the bottom track. So that's the first simple tool you can use to create a, a, a composite. Now, what does a composite mean? It basically just means you've got more than one stream of video showing in the video preview window at one time. So when I've got the opacity set to 100, I don't have a composite. I've got just one stream of video. But as I lower this opacity, and you start to see the other track from below come in, now I've got a composite in my video preview window. And you can see that uh, in the video preview window, you can see a little bit of both of those clips. So that's the basic uh, idea of compositing. Now, as I said, you've also got track level compositing tools. And uh, let me uh, let me move my I'll zoom back out a little bit so you can see my track header area over here. Uh, and this reminds me, uh, we get a lot of comments from previous webinars where people say, I can't see it, my window's too small. If you point to the window that comes up when you first came to the um, webinar page, you'll see two buttons appear on that window, and one of them is full. Click that full button, and you'll be able to view this presentation in full screen, uh, full screen mode and, and see a lot more effectively what I'm doing here. OK, so I've zoomed back out. And what I want to do is talk about another form of compositing at the track level, uh, and in fact, a couple more at the track level. The first one I'm going to talk about is using the track motion tools for compositing. So right now, I've reset that event opacity to 100, so you don't see the track below the man sitting on the rocks. But if I come over to the track motion dialog box here, click the track motion button, brings up the track motion dialog box, and I'll just sort of resize it so it kind of gets out of the way a little bit. I can use the tools in the track motion dialog box to adjust the output of that track. And it'll be the entire track. So if there's more than one event on that track, it'll affect all the events on that track in the same way. Now I've got a bunch of numbers over here. I can do it by the numbers, or I can just click to the position box over here and use that. In fact, what I'm going to do is just grab the corner of the position box and move it in. And you can see in the video preview window, as I move that position box in and out, the output of that track shrinks and grows, depending on which way I'm, I'm uh, moving it. So let's shrink it down. And I can then move it. I can rotate it. I can also put a shadow and a glow behind it. So this is all compositing. But it's, it's very, uh, very simple compositing with track motion, just coming in and changing the size of the output of that track for a picture-in-picture -picture effect. So if I had 20 tracks, and I wanted 19 of those tracks to be inset over the top of the bottom track, I could do that with each track and have uh, inset pictures of all the 19 tracks above. So track motion uh, is probably a tool many of you are, are familiar with, but it's, it is compositing. And there's a lot you can do with compositing with the track motion dialog box. I'm going to right click the dialog box and restore the box so that in the video preview window, you see, once again, uh, full size. Another track level compositing tool is a composite, a track composite envelope. If I right click on the track, or if I right click on the track header over here, I can choose insert, remove envelope, composite level. And when I do that, let's put this cursor back here so you can see the video preview window again. I get this blue envelope. And I'll zoom in once again so you can see a little bit better. And this blue envelope enables me to adjust the composite level of that track. So much like we did with the event composite uh, level tool, I can uh, change this up and down. This behaves almost identically to the event level composite envelope, except that you'll notice it stretches across the entire track. Additionally, with this tool, I can add different nodes to it. So if I right click that event or that uh, envelope and choose add point, I now have a point in the middle of the envelope. If I add another point, I now have broken my envelope up into segments. And I can change the settings of that envelope over time. So in other words, I'm automating my, my uh, composite here. So let's say I start with a composite level of 18%. Uh, and then uh, right click and add a point. And then maybe another point here. And I can raise this. 
and go to a composite level of, let's say, 65%. So if I play through this now, and I don't know how uh, great the playback frame rate is going to be for you over the, over the stream, but uh, you'll see that it starts out and then changes over time. I've automated that uh, composite level envelope. So you can add as many of these points as you want and change that composite over time as many times as you need to. So that's another great way of uh, getting some compositing going. Okay, so I just wanted to go through some of those basic compositing um, tools just so that you kind of have an, uh, the, uh, an idea of how compositing works in general. And let's move on then to a couple of um, topics that uh, may be a little bit more sophisticated. So let's take the same track. I'm going to right click and remove that uh, composite level envelope. So here we've got our, our uh, hero sitting on the rocks talking. Now one question we get a lot is how can I pixelate that guy's face like they do in Cops or whatever other show there that where they don't want you to be able to recognize who's in the video. And um, people ask that question all the time. Well, uh, it's pretty easy to do in Vegas Pro uh, with a compositing tool. And in fact, I believe you can also do the same thing in Vegas Movie Studio with compositing. Now, we used event level compositing. We've used track level compositing. Another way to create compositing is by using video effects filters. And in this case, I'm going to use a video effect filter called the cookie cutter. So over in my video effects window, I look for the cookie cutter filter. Here it is. And I'm going to use uh, that on the top track. So I'm just going to take and drag that to the top track. Now you can see what the cookie cutter filter does. Let me move this out of the way and resize it a little bit. It takes what's on the top track, cuts a hole in it basically, and just shows you what's inside the hole that it cut. And I can cut circles and diamonds and triangles and arrowheads and so forth. But for now, I'm going to leave it as a circle. And what I want to do is to uh, make this a little smaller so it's more the size of his face. And I'll change the center setting. Just reposition where the center of that is so it's right over his face. Okay. So now we've cut through that top track with the cookie cutter and we're seeing the bottom track. But what we really wanted to do is to be able to see his whole body and just pixelate his face. So what I need to do is to create another track. I'm going to uh, right click a track header, choose insert a video track. So I've got another video track underneath uh, in between the two existing ones. And then I'll just make a copy of that top, tr top uh, event. I'm going to hold down the control key and drag it straight down to the new track, making a copy. Now, because I made a copy, it still has the cookie cutter applied to it as well as the first one does. So I'm going to go to the effects chain for that uh, and remove the cookie cutter. So now you see the, uh, his whole body and the cookie cutter. You can kind of see how it's doing its thing uh, in the top track. So all I need to do now is to pixelate, uh, to pixelate this. So on the top track again, go back to my uh, event window where I've got the cookie cutter, I'm going to add a pixelate filter. So I'm just moving through my um, filters and effects here. Here's the pixelate filter. Uh, let's choose large and just add it to the chain. Okay, you, you might be able to say th see that it's, uh, it's a little more pixelated. Let me zoom in. Maybe you can see that a little bit better. Okay, so it's a little pixelated, not quite enough, so I'm going to raise the value of the pixelation. And if I do that enough, pretty soon, you can't tell who this guy is. Okay, so now his face is pixelated. And uh, again, the trick to doing that is that I just made a copy of the original event, put it underneath, cut the top event so it was just the, um, that we used the cookie cutter so it was just over his face and then added a pixelate filter to that to pixelate just the top. Now if, if as we scroll through this he moves, so there he moved his head, he tilts his head, he's kind of out of the pixelation area. Um, we can of course, we could either just make the pixela uh, pixelized area larger so that it includes when he moves his head or we could automate the position of 
the pixelate uh, setting. And let's just say when you get to that point, we just need to move it over a little bit. And so now, as we scrub through it, we can see that the pixelation moves from his, you know, from his starting position over, and then we just need to move it back when he puts his head back where it was. Okay, so you might need to go through and do a little keyframing, and um, you know, follow his movement. But you can see that uh, I can obscure his face with pixelization, pixelization uh, using compositing with the cookie cutter tool. Okay, now in previous webinars we've talked about the chroma key um, tool. I, I don't really want to uh, spend time going over that here because we've used it, but that's another form of compositing where you you take the background and um, and just remove it. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's let's go ahead and do it. it won't, won't take that long. We're going to delete that top track. And then on this bottom track, I'll come back over to my video preview window here. Let's zoom out. Uh, not my video preview window, but my effects window. And I'll find my chroma key filter, chroma keyer, and I'll drop it onto that top track. Okay, you can see it's already starting to work. I'm going to turn it off for a moment so that I can sample the colors that I want to key out, turn it back on. And now I can adjust the filter a little bit. And pretty quickly, uh, can create a, a pretty convincing picture of him sitting on the shores of this lake instead of the other lake that he was sitting at. So that there's another uh, compositing technique to use the chroma key filter to drop out a background. Okay. Now let's get a little bit more. Uh, let's get a little bit more complicated. Let me zoom this all the way out and uh, back to my explore window and start a new project here. Um, and what I want to do is to, uh, we're going to talk about compositing and how compositing works in um, the, the, the uh, signal flow, the video signal flow, and how it works. So let's, uh, let's find my, let's refresh this and find my basic compositing demo. That's the one I just used. Here it is, colors. This is the one I want. Okay. You can see in my project that uh, it's a very simple project uh, that I'm going to use to help explain how compositing works. So right now in this project I've got a red event or a, a, a blue event on the top and a red event on the bottom and in the video preview window you see blue. Well, why is that? Why do we see blue and not some red? Well, it's just like we just talked about. In the default mode of Source Alpha, the default compositing mode, Vegas Pro sees just what's on top. So one key to understanding compositing is that Vegas Pro works from the bottom up. So the bottom track is going to be shown first, and then the next track up will be shown second. And in this case, since there's no transparency in that first track, it's totally obscuring the bottom track, just like we saw a little bit earlier. Um, let me switch over to PowerPoint for a second here and see if I can show you, uh, give you some idea of what's going on with this. So you can see that since we're set to source alpha in the composite mode for, th for the top track, nothing shows through. There's no, there's no alpha channel, there's no transparency, so you see blue and no red. I already mentioned that compositing works from the bottom up. So you start what's on the with what's on the bottom, and then you do whatever you with what's on the next track up. And because it works that way, it's the compositing mode of the top track that's going to affect the output that you get. So let's take a look at a couple of different scenarios here. If I change the compositing mode to that top track of that top track from source alpha, click that button. You've got a whole bunch of different compositing modes here and they all work on your video according to mathematical formulas. The two easiest ones to understand are add and subtract because it's just plain simple addition and subtraction. So let's change the top track's uh, compositing mode to add and see what happens. When I do that, you can see that we're set to add mode here. 
And what we end up with in the video preview window is magenta. Okay, so why is that happening? Well, we're starting with red and we're adding blue to it. If I go back to PowerPoint, I can show you how it works. You've got red on the bottom track. That's what you start with. And the, the uh, RGB uh, recipe for red is 25500. Then you've set your track to add. We compositing mode to add. So you're adding to the red that you started with, blue, whose recipe is 00255. So just simple addition, adding those together, 255 plus 0 equals 255. 0 plus 0 equals 0. And 0 plus 255 equals 255. So the result, the recipe of the result is 255, 0, 255. And that happens to be the recipe for magenta. So you can see that when you're compositing, using these compositing modes, it's just mathematics that are determining what it's going to look like. Now, of course, if this were, these were two pieces of video, it wouldn't be quite so uh, cut and dried, and, and you'd get some interesting uh, results depending on what kind of, uh, you know, what colors were in the videos that you're using and so forth. But this is a real simple, uh, e simple example of addition. Now, if we subtract, if we set that top track to the subtract composite mode, look what we get. We get red. Now, that might seem confusing at first. You're starting with red, you're subtracting blue, and you end up with red. But let's go back to PowerPoint and take a look at the math and see why that happens. So again, red 255.00 minus blue 00.255. If you do the math, it's 255 minus 0 is 255. 0 minus 0 is 0. And 0 minus 255, well, in the RGB color mode, you can't go below 0. So 0 minus 255 is 0. And so the recipe you end up with is 255.00, which is exactly the same as the recipe for red. And that's why we see red in the video preview window. OK. Now that you kind of have an understanding of working from the bottom up, and subtraction really shows that really well, because you're starting with red, you're subtracting blue. Uh, if you were starting with blue and subtracting red, you'd get a different result. But it's it, it, now that you understand the working from the bottom up, let's throw one more wrinkle into this. Let me go back to my media generators. I'm going to go get a uh, color gradient. I'll take this red, green, and blue color gradient and drop it out of the bottom track. So now if we set, I'm going to set the top track back to add. We've got magenta in the video preview window. And you don't see what's on the bottom track, this multicolored event, because the source, the uh, composite mode for Track two is set to source alpha, and so it's just ignoring that bottom track. It's covering that bottom track. So you end up with um, magenta in the video preview window. But we can use a little bit more sophisticated compositing tool, and that's the parent-child relationships that are available between tracks in Vegas Pro. And to do that, I'm going to first just make um, track two a, comp a compositing child of track one. So I just click the Make Compositing uh, Child button. You don't see anything happen visually, but, we are, but we've just changed the signal flow. And I'll show you how that works in a moment. So what it does is now, when you've got a, child, a parent child relationship like this, it does that first. So the first thing Vegas Pro does is it goes through and it sees you've got a ch parent child relationship. And according to your composite mode for track one, you're adding those two together and you, you get magenta. But you now also have a, a, a parent compositing mode. So you can take that magenta, that, that result of, the, of grouping those two in a parent-child relationship, and composite it with the bottom track. So if I composite using, let's say, subtract mode, let's see what we get. So now we get this green bar with black in the corners. OK, so why is it happening? Well, think of it. Think of, think of the, the signal flow. First, the red and the blue are changing to magenta because we're adding them together. And then we're taking the three colors at the bottom and subtracting magenta from those three colors. So let's go back to PowerPoint and take a look, see if this makes uh, some sense. So you're adding red and blue with the add um, composite mode, and that results 255, 255, zero, uh, 255, zero, 255. That's magenta, you remember? 
Then we're subtracting, using the parent mode, we're subtracting that magenta from what's on track three, which is blue, green, and red. <coughs> so if you remember the recipe for blue up here in the left-hand corner, blue is 0, two, uh, 0, 0, 255. So if you had 0, 0, 255 above magenta, you'd have 0 minus 255, which is 0, 0 minus 0, which is 0, and 255 minus 255, which is also 0. So the result in that upper corner is 0, 0, 0, which is black. The same holds true in the lower right-hand corner where you're, where you're subtracting the red. Uh, you'd still end up with black, 0, 0, 0. And the only place you have color is the green in the middle, which is unaffected because 0 in the uh, magenta composite minus, or uh, 0 in green minus the 0, sorry, 255 in green minus the 0 in the magenta composite is 255. So you end up with 0, 255, 0. And that's why you see a green slash through the middle. All right, all that stuff is, is you know, a little mathematical and can be a little bit difficult to understand, but we'll, we'll have this webinar archived um, later and you can come back and uh, go over it again. We also have a free training video that goes into a little bit more tr uh, detail about this compositing uh, tools uh, up on the website, so give that a look too. So I wanted to go through all that so that we could go through our next example. And in this example, I'm going to take, uh, going to take a piece of text. Uh, let's see, I just need to open this project. In this project, I've got a text event, which is black and white, over the top of two, um, two uh, video events on the tracks below it. Now, the video events that I have on the tracks below it are exactly the same, except that I've applied a Gaussian blur to one of them. So if I solo track two, you see the lake. If I solo track three, you see the blurry lake. And our task is to fill the words Devil's Lake with the clear version of the lake and fill the black area that you see out here with the blurred version of the lake. And so we're going to use uh, a combination of masking techniques and compositing techniques to make this happen. In fact, masking is, is essentially just a compositing technique. And we're going, to, uh, we're going to make this happen. So the first thing I want to do is I want to mask out the black in uh, the text. So to do that, I'm going to go to my video effects window. And I'm going to find my mask generator. And I'm going to do this by luminance. If I drop the luminance preset onto that event, you can see that it, it, it masks out the black. So basically what's happening here is it's looking for luminance and it's preserving high luminance and getting rid of low luminance. Well, white is completely luminant, 100% luminance, and black is no luminance. So it's removing the low luminance and uh, preserving the, the high luminance. Now, if there was a blend in here, you'd see a blend uh, happening. But in this case, it's just black and white, so it's either on or off. So that's step number one. Now I also want to composite. <coughs> I also want to composite this, these tracks so that we let the uh, blurry uh, version of the lake show through. So what I'm going to do is to change the composite mode for the top track to multiply mask. And when I do that, it uh, it creates. Basically, it, it, it lets the, um, the track just below it, I'm compositing this track, track two, with track one according to track one's composite mode, which in, in this case is uh, multiply mask. Now, the math is a little more complicated than it, than it was with the add and subtract, but it's the same concept. We're taking the bottom track and combining it with the top track according to the composite mode of the top track. So we end up with the uh, the... Uh, lake inside the words just like we wanted, but now we've got black back around the outside. So why are we getting black? Well, what we've done is we've created transparency. We've created an alpha channel on that top, uh, on the combination of the top two tracks. And what you see as black here is actually th showing through to the background of the, the project. Why isn't it showing through to track three? Well, because track two's alpha channel is set to 
uh, uh, composite mode is, is set to source alpha. And so track two is obscuring track three. And remember, it works from the bottom up. So picture, you know, imagine laying down track three, which is the blurry track, then laying track two over the top of it, so you no longer see track three, and then merging track two with track one to create the, the composite. So the composite of those two tracks is looking through to the bottom uh, of, of the project. Well, that's not really what we want, so how can we fix that? Well, remember, if we, uh, as we did a moment ago, if we make a parent-child relationship, it's going to do what's in the parent-child relationship first, then, according to the parent compositing mode, composite that with whatever's underneath it. So if we make track two a composite child of track one, now we have what we want. We have first track two being composited with track one according to track one's composite mode. And then that whole thing, that whole group, is composited with track three. And because the composite between two and one created an alpha channel, you see through to what's on track three. And you can see the results of this if I add, I'll go to the track motion and add a drop shadow to the clear text. And um, you'll be able to see, oh, sorry, that's not where I wanted to go. I want to go to uh, the parent motion and add a shadow there. And you'll see the results a little bit better where you've got the uh, clear text. I'll zoom in on that so you can see it. You've got the clear text the clear picture in the text and the blurry picture outside of the text and that's a pretty cool effect. Okay, let me zoom back out and I'm going to reset this project and I'll just do it without all the explanation just so you can get the steps down uh, a little bit better. So I've explained how it works, now I'll just show you the steps so you can do it quickly. Take the luminance mask, drop it on the first event. You don't need this anymore so you can delete it. Change the first track's compositing mode to multiply mask. And then make the, the uh, second track a child of the first track. OK. Then I added a parent motion shadow. And just like that, we have it. So it took me a long time to explain what was happening, but it's, it's pretty uh, easy to do quickly once you understand it. So that's a, um, that's a fun technique to use. Okay, let's switch uh, our focus to Bezier masking for a little bit. And we've talked about Bezier masking uh, in previous webinars. I've, I, talked about, um, I talked about it fairly extensively when we looked at using still images in, in Vegas Pro. So you might want to go back and review that webinar uh, as well. Um, but I wanted to talk about it a little bit here too so that I can, we can kind of talk about how the tool actually works. Let me just give you a quick example of how you can use the Bezier masking tool and some compositing tricks that we've already worked on to fix a problem video. So here's, here's our hero sitting at the lake, and he's in nice bright sunshine, but here he is in a different uh, location at the lake, sitting on a bench, but the bench is under a tree, and he's, uh, he's, pretty, he's pretty dark, he's in the shadow of the tree. So what, what we want to do is to match his, the brightness of this uh, guy when he's sitting under the tree with when he's sitting out in the open sunshine. Okay, well the problem is uh, we could easily go up to the video effects window and maybe I choose something like a color curve and I'll drop a color curve on there and I can start fiddling with this color curve so that I brighten him up but obviously when I do that you'll notice that the background is getting blown out because the background was already pretty nicely um, pretty nicely um, uh, exposed, but now I've overexposed it with the color curves. So I've got him looking nice, but he's but the background is 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 way out, way way blown out. Uh, now, one way that I can see does this match the the clip that I'm trying to match it to? I'll use the I'll use a, a tool a lot of people uh, miss in Vegas Pro, which is a pretty neat tool. It's the split screen view tool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to park my cursor in the, in the, in the event that I want, the, the target event, and I'm going to click the Copy Snapshot to Clipboard button. That takes a copy of that frame and puts it on my Windows Clipboard. I can then use my split screen view and set it to Clipboard to see 
uh, that picture uh, in, in, in the video preview window. Now if I reposition my cursor, you can see that it's split. The, the right half is the live video and the left half is the picture that I took and put on the clipboard. If I play the project, you'll see that the picture on the left is just the static picture. I can either go right and left like this or I can define a new area. So what I want to do is to try to define an area that includes his face in both. And now I can go back to my curves and adjust this until I'm happy that my the brightness of his face in this video matches the brightness of his brightness in the target video. Okay, so let's call that good enough. I'm happy. Uh, don't forget to turn your split screen view off. A lot of times people get caught with split, split screen view on and they can't figure out what's going on. So make sure to turn that off. So now I need to solve the problem of the fact that the background is all blown out. And I can do that with some of the compositing tools that we've been using uh, and also the, the um, Bezier masking tool. So what I'm going to do is to make a copy of this event. I'm just uh, holding down my control key and dragging it down to the bottom, the event below it. I'm going to take the color curves off that copy so that it's not copied. So now if I solo the bottom track, you see the original. And if I unsolo it, you see the, uh, the corrected one on top. So what we have to do is to um, isolate him on the top track so that we can see through to the bottom track where the, where the lake is, is well um, exposed. So I'm going to use the event pan crop tool for the top track to do this. And in the event pan crop, pan crop tool, let me just sort of resize it and move it into position here. I'm going to use specifically the Bezier masking tools. And to get to the Bezier masking tools, I'm going to turn my sync off here. To get to the Bezier masking tools, I just select the checkbox. And you'll notice that the tools change on the left-hand side. And I'll just do this one real quickly, and then we'll come back and uh, talk about them in a little bit more detail. But what I'm going to do is to just make a fairly rough mask around this guy. And I'm being pretty sloppy about this, but you might want to take a little bit more time and do a nice mask. But in this case, this is actually going to work out pretty well. Now you can see the results in the preview window already. You can see the good uh, video from the bottom track and the corrected video of the man in the top track. Of course, you also have this sharp, ugly uh, mask in your project. Well, to get rid of that, we're going to go back to the masking tool. I'm going to choose a uh, feather type. I'm going to change it from none to both, both in and out, and then raise it a little bit. And you can see as I raise it, I'm sort of feathering the edges of it so that now you don't see the edge of it. You can still see around him it's glowing, so I might want to come in and, and uh, make some adjustments to this mask so that it's not quite glowing quite so much around him. But you can see how if I would take a lot of time here, that I can really make a pretty convincing mask that unless you had seen me do that, you'd be pretty unlikely to, to be able to know that I'd, that I'd corrected this clip in that way. And uh, that is, the Bezier masking tool is another compositing uh, tool that we can use to, um, in this case, salvage some video that, that wasn't really going to be that usable. Now again, just like in uh, when we were using the cookie cutter, he might move, and if he moves, he might move out of the mask area, but the way I've got this mask um, feathered and, and positioned, he moves out of it, but you don't really notice in the, in the video when he does as I scrub through. So we're looking pretty good. And as, we, uh, as I play it from this clip to the next, the clips now match much better. And it's the Bezier masking tool that enabled me to salvage that piece of video um, in conjunction with the, with the video effects uh, color correction that I did. All right, I, pr I promised a, uh, a cloning um, experiment here, so let's take a look at that. All right, this is, uh, if you've been following some of our training materials for the last 10 years, you might recognize this. Uh, this is an old, um, an old piece that we did. 
Uh, but it's a good, it's an oldie but a goodie, right? So let's take a look at, I'll, I'll show you first the, um, the final result of what we're going to do here, and then I'll show you how we do it. And basically what we, what, what we have is this lady uh, playing her guitar, and then she gets to the solo of the song, and all of a sudden there she is playing her guitar and her mandolin and her lead guitar and her bass, all in the same picture. So how did we do that? How did we, how did we create that clone effect? Well, over here in this section of the video, I have the same three tracks, um, or the same, the same tracks, I just don't have them finished out. So let's go through it real quickly and finish it out. If I solo, if I mute the top track where she's holding her mandolin, mandolin you see right under it, she's with her bass. If I mute that one, she's got her lead guitar. And the bottom one is the main video where she's uh, holding her acoustic guitar. And you can see that we shot her in the same position in each one of these, uh, these videos, in this little pool of light um, in, a in, in a dark room. The only thing different is that we changed the instrument she was holding and we took the microphone away in the uh, other, other shots. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use a combination of a couple of the tools that we just talked about. We're going to use Bezier masking and we're going to use track motion. So first thing I'm going to do is to go to the Bezier masking tool for this top track. And again, I'm just going to make a real quick mask around her. Doesn't have to be that exact. So there I've got her masked out. And I'll put a little bit of a feather around it, both in and out, feather it, just like we did with the, the man on the, uh, on the shores of the lake. So there she is. You don't really notice anything different in the video preview window, but when I go to my track motion tool and make her smaller and move her off into a different spot, now all of a sudden there she is in the backstage playing her mandolin. Um, let's put her, I think I had her over here in the original video, so let's put her there. Uh, qu real quickly we go to the, the bass track, turn on the masking, make another quick mask. Now I spent a little more time making nice masks when I actually did this, but uh, this gives you the idea. And set this to both and raise the mask a little bit. So there she is playing her bass. We'll go to the track motion tool for the bass, drop it down. Uh, there she is. Okay, I want her to be in front of the mandolin and right now she's being obscured by the mandolin. So I'm just going to reorder the tracks over here. And there she is on top. Might need to move the mandolin over a little bit. Oops, that's the bass, sorry. switch the tracks. There we go. Now we'll move the mandolin over a little bit. So she's standing way off in the back. And then, uh, of course, do the same thing with the guitar, the lead guitar. And real quickly, use the track motion tool to move that one and make it smaller. So real quickly, we have our clone in place, or our clones in place. And we've created, you know, we've, we've altered reality here by putting uh, this lady into her, uh, her video four different times as her band. So let me go back and play the, the one that was done properly so that you can see what it looks like. Okay, so just using track motion and Bezier masking, I could place her in various positions in the, in the frame. And then I just added fades in and fades out so that you could, uh, so that sh she would come in and out like that. Um, okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is let's talk about the Bezier masking tools a little bit in a little bit more detail so you can really see how they work. So here's just a real simple uh, video with the, the word it shown over the top of uh, a colored background, a, a, a noise texture background. Let me solo the noise texture so you see what the noise looks like. And there it is. Okay, so what I want to do is to use Bezier masking to uh, outline, to, to knock out the word it. Uh, in this case, we could use a mask filter and do it uh, instantaneously, but in this, you know, I just wanted to demonstrate the use of the Bezier masking tool, so let's do it that way. So let me bring the Bezier masking tool up, and since we're going to be looking at this in 
little bit more detail. I'm going to make it quite a bit bigger. So hopefully you can see how it works. And then I'll zoom in a little bit with the tool here. OK. So here's our, our, our large words. We've turned the mask on. And when we do, we get this series of tools over here. So let's talk about what these tools are. The first tool basically just allows me to show or hide the properties section. By default, it's on. I'll turn it off just to give myself a little bit more room and make this a little bit bigger. The second tool is the normal edit tool. And with this tool, I can grab it and move it and, and uh, you know just reposition it and so forth. The next tool is the anchor creation tool. And the anchor creation tool is the tool you're going to use to, um, to draw the mask. So you can see that it looks sort of like a little pen. And when I've got this, there are two different types of points that I can create. I'm going to mask out the eye using the first type. And that is just corner points. So if I point to the corner and click, it drops a little point there. Move to the next corner and click, it drops another point and connects the two with a line. And I can just go around the dot of the eye and when I've gotten all the way around, just point to the first one again and click at the first one again, and it closes the mask. And over in the video preview window, you can see that I've masked out everything but what I just included in that mask. OK, now I wanted it to be the opposite. I wanted to fill that with, fill the, the letter with the background color. So I need to bring my properties back. And I'm going to change my mode from positive which means it's going to just show what's in the, in the mask, to negative, which means it's going to show everything but what's in the mask. OK? And now I can see that my mask, if you look over in the video preview window, I didn't do a very good job. I've got some white showing up in here. And so I can make some adjustments. Now, to make those adjustments, I'm going to go back to the normal edit tool. I'm going to first click away from the mask to deselect everything, and then just select the point I want to move and move it into place. So I'll move this one a little bit, move this one. So I'm just moving these into place. Okay? And now my mask looks a little bit better. OK, let's do the rest of the, the eye. So I'm going to get my anchor creation tool again and add my points. Now, if I accidentally add a, the wrong point in the wrong spot, I can either move it or I can use the anchor deletion tool to click it and get rid of it. OK, so in that case, since I had them all selected, it de deselected all of them. So let's start again. And I just go around this, the rectangle and close it up. And now the path is complete, but you don't see the results over here. Because remember, you've already, I've already made one with a negative um, path. So in order to make this one show up, I need to set this mode also to negative. And now we see that we have our eye. And again, I could go back in and adjust those top two points to get rid of that little uh, white line that we have. OK, so that's the first type of point that you can create with the, with the Bezier masking tool. That's the, uh, the corner point. You just click, and it makes a, a, a point that has a, a sharp corner. The other type you can make uh, is a curved point that would enable us to, to mask around the curve of this T. So I've still got my anchor creation tool. and let's. Let's create our mask around the T. I'm going to start over here, and I'm just going to do all the straight points, straight parts first. And so I'm just like I did with the eye, I'm just clicking in the corners, dropping points, and those points are being, uh, are being um, connected with lines. But now I have to think a little bit, because I've got a curve coming up. And this takes some getting used to. And the only way that you're going to really learn to, to do it is to, to just get in there and start experimenting with it. What I want to do is to try to de decide where the curve kind of begins. And, and I have to make a decision about how much of that curve I think I can get with just adding two points. Well, to me, it looks like the curve starts right about here. So I'm going to drop a point there. But this time, instead of just dropping, just clicking and letting it drop a corner point, I'm going to click and drag in the direction of the top of the curve, which creates a, a curve point and gives me some curve handles. And you'll see how that works in a second. Um, let me zoom in on this a little bit and move this up so that you can see what I've done here. OK, so there's the, the point that I just created. Now, you might notice on the top that, that the line is, is going off of my, my uh, letter a little bit. And that's because I've created a curve point. 
if I get my move tool, I can take a hold of those handles and move them and adjust the curve that are created by that handle. So in this case, I don't want there to be a curve, I want that to be straight, so I'm just gonna put the, the handle right along the top, right along the line that I want it to go to, to create a straight line between this point and the other point. But now I need to add another point at the other end of that curve, and so let's go ahead and do that. So I've got the first, let's select the first curve point, and now right about here, I'll add another point. And as I move this handle, you can see that I've created a curve. So now with these curve handles in place, I can uh, position this properly and I can adjust the curve so that it fits. All right, so I've got it looking pretty good down here at the bottom, but it doesn't work very well here. So I take this handle and move it. Well, as soon as I do, look what happens. I'm not only adjusting this curve, the one that I want to adjust, but I'm also inadvertently adjusting this curve over here. And that's the one that we had already set straight. So I have to be able to move this curve, adjust this curve, without adjusting this curve. And to do that, I'm going to use this tool right here, the Split Tangent Tool. Now you'll notice when I point to the curve handle, the, my mouse icon changes to a little hollow arrow. And this enables me to split this tangent from the other one, and now I can adjust this handle, which is called a tangent, independently of the other side of the curve. So now I can come in and make this just the way I want it, and between the two of these, I can uh, adjust it until I'm happy. Okay, now if I, if I try and I try and I try and I just can't get it, then I might need to adjust where these anchor points are because um, that might have an effect on how I can position these. But in this case, it looks like I've done pretty well. I've got that curve um, looking pretty good. So I'm going to uh, go back and get my normal, ed normal edit tool, deselect all of them and select the last one that I made, go get my pen tool, and continue on creating my path. Okay, now, again, you can see that down here, this is falling off, so I'm gonna need to go select that point, get my split tangent tool. Now, notice this time, when I point to that uh, point, it, uh, if you can see it, my arrow is not hollow this time. That's because this tangent is already split. And I can see that because the right half of it is yellow and the left half of it is not. If I was to click it again, I'd rejoin them and I'd mess up the curve I have over here. So you have to be careful about uh, the, the look of that. Since, my, since it's already split, I don't want to re-split it. So I'm going to hold my control key and that gives me my split tangent tool again. And now I can adjust that point. Okay, so in the same way I can uh, select the next line, get my pen tool, make that point, and carry on. So, uh, kind of running out of time here, so I'm not going to complete this last curve, but you can see how, uh, I'll just do it real, real sloppy, sloppily here, just to, just to get it done. Uh, but you can see how I can go ahead and add points and change this to negative, and now both my words, er, both my letters are um, masked out. So the Bezier masking tools, uh, they're, they're not really that complicated, but they are difficult to learn to use and to, to become proficient at. And it's, it, it, a couple of the key points to remember, especially, is the split tra tangent tool. And if it's hollow, that means you're about to split the tangent. If it's um, fo filled, it's solid black, that means you're about to join the tangents. And when you're working with curves like we have here, you're going to need to split those tangents so that you can work with one side of the tangent independently of the other side, okay? Um, another thing that, that you can uh, get used to is, I, I've been coming up and switching tools manually up here, but you can access most of these tools with keyboard commands. So right now I have the normal edit tool. If I press the, the, the um, uh, command key, the control key, I get the anchor creation tool. So now I can 
create another mask. As soon as I let go of it, I lose that tool and it goes back to the normal edit tool again. So just get used to uh, just experiment with the different keys, the Alt key, the Control key, and the Shift key, and find out what, uh, what those do, do to modify the tools that you're using. Uh, another tip, if you need to move a mask, the whole mask, uh, with, the, with the normal edit tool, select the mask, but you select it by clicking on a point. And if you do that, you only get one point. So if you try to move it, you're, gonna, you're going to reshape the point. So what you need to do is to, is to, uh, sorry, is to hold down the Alt key when you click on that point, and now you've got them all. So hold the Alt key, click on a point, and now you've got all of them and can move the mask. Um, another, another pitfall is if I've got the, the, the normal edit tool and I think I'm just going to move this line out, if I grab hold of this line and move it, instead of moving it out, it creates a corner points and now I've changed my mask again. So if you're going to, if you want to move uh, uh, one side, then click the first point, hold the shift key, click the second point, and then you can move it. Okay, so just little keyboard commands like that that you need to uh, kind of get used to when you're working with the Bezier masking tool. All right, let me just jump back to my PowerPoint slide here just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, okay, good. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, I went through some of those things pretty quickly. Uh, of course, we're going to archive this so you can go back and look at it. But Hopefully what you got out of this is that when you start working with compositing tools and masking tools, you can really start taking some creative uh, tr turns in your projects, things that you uh, haven't maybe done before. Um, as usual, we have a, a, promo, a promotional uh, promotion going on here during the webinar today. And so for this week only, starting today and ending uh, next week on January 31st, you can get 20% off of the regular price of the, the newly printed uh, digital, audio, d digital video and audio production book. Uh, this is the book that we use as the study guide for our first level of Vegas uh, certification, the Sony Certified Vegas User, SCVU certification. So if you're, thinking about, um, if you're thinking about getting certified as a user, which is the first level of certification, and you might want to uh, take advantage of this 20% off deal to get the book because if you know what's in that book and you can answer the, the questions at the end uh, of each module of that book, then you're pretty, you're pretty well assured to be prepared for the SCVU exam. Okay, so that's uh, going on from today until a week from today. Okay, so that kind of wraps up what I wanted to talk about uh, and we're almost at the top of the hour. I went pretty long, but uh, if you guys don't mind, then we'll, um, we'll just take a few extra minutes to ask, uh, answer a few questions. So you got some questions over there, Whitney? Yes, I do have a few. The first question is, can I place a masking filter on the track level? Uh, yeah. The masking, let's go back to the computer here. Masking filters work just like any other filter. So um, you can put it in all the normal places that you put um, any other filter. So if I go to my video, effect, uh, video event effects and find my mask, generator, here it is, and just drop it on the track. Now I've applied it to the track instead of the, uh, the event. So yeah. Okay. Um, is it possible to blur multiple faces in an event? Um, yeah, you would just basically use the same technique that, that I used. Um, well, there are a couple of different ways to do it. Let's, I think what I would do, let me take the mask uh, off of this and, and show you. I think what I would do is I would go into that top event and I'd create multiple Bezier masks just like we did here. So I'd, you, you, could, you could imagine this, uh, the word it, as three different faces. So I've got one mask covering this face, one mask covering this face, and one mask covering this face. Um, so yeah, you could just create three different masks. Uh, in, the, in the presentation I did it with the cookie cutter, but it might be um, in this case where you want to do multiples, it might be better to, to mask it out with the Bezier masking tools. Okay, and we had a few people ask if you could reshow how to move a blur with a person uh, as he or she moves across the frame. Move a blur with the person, okay. Uh, so let's get that project back up here. Um, trying to remember which one it was. Uh, 
this one. Okay. So here he is, he's in our frame. The way we created the, the pixelation or the blur uh, was first I made a copy of this, I'll just duplicate the track, I made a copy of, of the event. Then on the top event, I put a cookie cutter. So here's my cookie cutter, I just dropped that cookie cutter on top. Um, and I'm going to mute track two for a second so that we can see what's uh oh my. Okay, so let's mute track two for a second so that we can see that the cookie cutter is doing its its business. And uh, I'm going to change the center so it's more over his face. I'm going to change the size so it's covering just essentially his head. Okay. So. Um, um, then what we did was, I'm trying to remember what we did, we, we added a pixelation filter to this top track. So let's pixelate that, let's add that here, and then we just uh, raised the pixelation so you couldn't see it, or since so you couldn't recognize his face. So there we've got our pixelated guy. And if I unmute the bottom track, you see the rest of the video. So the question was, he moves, so how do we move the pixelation with him? Well, in this case, I've made the pixelation large enough that it doesn't really matter that he moves. So let me make it a little smaller so that uh, it doesn't really cover him when he moves. Okay, so there he's, he's moved. And now he moves his head and he goes out of the frame. So the way I had that follow him was to use the uh, animation tools. I'm going to animate the center parameter here. So I'm going to click animate and move this up a little bit so you can see it. Okay, and then I just need to find where he moves out of frame. So I'm, so I'm uh, kind of scrolling through it. And there's where he sort of moved out of frame. So I'm going to sync my cursor up at that point and just change my location, adding a new keyframe. And so now when I move this back and forth, the pixelation moves with him. Okay, so it's all about animation in the keyframe controller area. And if you're not familiar with that, we have another webinar from a, a while ago that talks about keyframe animation. Uh, you might want to visit that and um, um, learn how to do that. Can you define the Bezier path by typing the numeric values of the positions of the points instead of clicking with the mouse? Okay, so let's take a look at that. I'm going to mute this top track so it's just out of the mix here. And go to the Bezier Masking tool, turn it on. And here's, here are my points. Um, I'll just make some points in here. Once I've added the points, then, yeah, I can change the point location by moving it here, or I can change the selected point location by using the tools up here or just typing something in, so 100 maybe. So yeah, the question is, can I move the points or the, the mask by um, using the, 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 uh, the numbers in the properties area? And the answer is yes. OK. And do we have time for one more? Uh, let's do one more if you got one. OK. Is it possible to lock track motion keyframes to an event? Is it possible to lock track motion keyframes to an event? Um, by default, when you add track motion, so let's uh, take the Bezier mask off of uh, this track. And let's use track motion to create a, a, a keyframe, or a picture-in-picture. Uh, -picture. So the question is, can I lock the keyframe to that event? Well, if I add, if I drop my cursor in here, and I sync it up and add a keyframe, and let's say I just add another one just a little down the line here and I move it. So now we've created this little motion. By default, those keyframes are going to, to lock to the event. So when I move the event, you can see down in, in the bottom here that it did move the keyframe. And so even though I've moved the event out, the keyframes uh, did come with it. So yes, it is possible and that's, it actually happens uh, automatically. All right, so uh, let's 
hit the PowerPoint one last time, just make sure I'm not missing anything. And um, that brings us to the end. So hopefully uh, we talked really quickly about a lot of uh, fairly detailed stuff here, but hopefully you get the idea of compositing and masking in Vegas Pro. Uh, Vegas Pro is, is actually an incredibly powerful compositing tool as, as well as a video editing tool. And unless you're really taking advantage of all the power that, that you've got with compositing, you're not taking advantage of Vegas Pro. And maybe you can use some of the techniques that we went over here to start experimenting and uh, you know, take your projects into different directions. Um, a couple of the key points that I want you to walk away with uh, really important to remember that compositing works from the bottom up. You start with the bottom track and then you start doing things to it with whatever's on the top track according to the composite mode that you've, you've set. Um, there is, a, as I mentioned earlier, there's a video online, a free training video that talks about composite modes uh, even in a little bit more detail than uh, I talked about it here. So, so go hunt that down at sonycreativesoftware.com slash training. Uh, and um, you can take a look at that. There's webinars that we've archived that talk about the Bezier masking tool. Specifically, the one that I'm thinking of is the, um, uh, the, the working with still images webinar. We, we did a lot of stuff with the Bezier masking tool in that webinar. So if you need help uh, and you want more examples of the Be Bezier masking tool, take a look at that uh, webinar archive. We'll have this one archived um, within two weeks. Uh, typically, I've been getting them up there uh, earlier than that. But uh, we'll take all of the questions that you've uh, sent in via the chat and we'll work up answers for those and, and get all that stuff posted online in the webinar archives uh, section. So uh, that's all I can think of uh, to say and I think we're done. So uh, don't forget about the promo that lasts for another week and um, we'll see you in the next webinar. So long.